This is Twit. At the Dota 2 World Championship this August, professional gamers will face off against bots created by OpenAI. Joining us to talk about what this competition means for our dystopian future is Dave Gershgorn, artificial intelligence reporter at Quartz. Welcome back to the show, Dave. Hey, thanks for having me. So we've seen bots beat chess. Uh, we've seen chess masters. We've seen them beat Go masters. But what's different about this competition is that humans are a team of five. Are there also five bots or is it five against one? Yeah, so they are actually five separate bots. Um, and OpenAI has done this cool thing um, where they have them all work together by giving them something called team spirit. Um, and it's something that they kind of like turn up over the course of the match. And it's just a metric where the bots can kind of weigh their own performance against the team per team's performance. So at the beginning of the match, the bots are actually really, really selfish. And they try and steal kills from each other and do, you know, everything that you wouldn't want a teammate to be doing. Um, but by the end of the ma match, they are working in kind of like perfect inhuman harmony. Um, and that's all just because this one number between zero and one gets gets kind of artificially tweaked and turned up. Hmm. So, so I know why um, we put pitted bots against chess masters and Go was something different. So why mm -hmm. Dota 2? Like what, what about the game itself uh, makes it uh, really fitting to try to put b b bot, pit bots against humans? Yeah, so, so Dota 2 is a, a part of these classic games called MOBAs, um, where it's always pretty much the same map. Um, <laughs> there are a few characters that you can play from, um, which means that since it's always kind of the same map and there's always kind of the same objective, which is to like infiltrate the enemy's uh, little fortress and, and to kind of defeat their their base, um, it's, it's always the same objective. So there's not a lot of variance in actually how the, the game is played. Um, so you're in a really, con even though there are different moves that you can make, different characters that you can play as, different strategies, you're always kind of going in the same direction um, trying to achieve the same objective. So while the, the space is a lot maybe uh, broader than a Go board or a chess board, um, it, it's still a fairly constrained uh, type of game. One thing that perplexes me about AI and this idea of training it by having it play, you know, a virtualized version of the game over and over and over again, you write, in this case, the equivalent of 5,000 years of the game, which is kind of hard to comprehend. One thing that perplexes me about that is I would imagine that if a human A could live 5,000, you know, long enough, to, you know, 5,000 years of, of playing this game, they'd be the best dang player in the entire, you know, world and never be able to be beat unless someone had had more experience than that yet in in this case the robots the ai five thousand years we still think we can beat them why why is there a discrepancy there i would think yeah. after five thousand years you'd be like the best period well like after like all of this reporting on ai something that you really begin or i really begin to realize like how amazing the human brain is like we're so optimized to learn after like one or two experiences yeah. um like you know if you like knock over your water bottle on your desk once or twice and it trashes your macbook or whatever it's like or uh it's always gonna live in your mind you're never gonna forget it but a, a, a ai that's like doing some re type of reinforcement learning might need to do that 100 200 times um so it, it's Got it. Humans are, like, really good at learning, and these bots really aren't. Yet. <laughs> yes. Yet. Yet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so what about, like, diminishing returns in, term of, in terms of, like, the computing power required to get better and better? Are there, are there any diminishing returns that we have to worry about? In yeah, terms it, of bots? it's kind of an interesting equation because when I was talking to OpenAI CTO uh, Greg Brockman, he was talking about how, like, the more compute that they throw at this, and they through like massive amounts, you know, somebody did like a back of the uh, envelope math on, on Twitter and they were thinking, you know, tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars in compute. Um, the, the more that the compute that they throw at it, the better it gets. Um, and, and he kept on saying that like we're, we thought we were going to hit this kind of like magic wall where like the compute was going to run out and the AI wouldn't get any better or, or learn new things. And they just didn't find it. The longer they trained it, the better they got. Um, and it was really after a long training session where they kind of found that they were already mimicking um, moves that human masters do. So it, it's it's only uh, up from here. And I think that's what's so kind of crazy about this is that 
they didn't find a limit. The only thing that they tapped out was pretty much like the amount of compute they can throw at it. Did were there any limits that were placed on the bots? Like any gameplay rules, uh, things that they were or were not allowed to do in order to keep things fair, or is pr pretty much like you say, limitless entirely? Yeah, so so they did limit the bots a little bit in that uh, in how they can interact with the map. So right now there are uh, a few special items that they can't use. Um, they can't summon other uh, other play. I mean, like characters onto the board. There are a few like spells that will summon like a few little guys to fight for you, um, and they can't use something called wards, which are um, I, I, I had a correspondence with like a. a top 10% Dota 2 player, and he was saying that it was really weird that they weren't using wards because it's critical to the, the play. And what a ward does is it you place it in a part of the map, and then you can see that part of the map even if you're not there. Um, so like Dota 2, is a lot, there's a lot about understanding who is where on the map, and, and the bots really have an incomplete version of that. So it's also kind of notable that they're so good without being able to use some of the core mechanics. But that being said, OpenAI is trying to work that out in time for the international so uh we're hoping to see bots that can kind of completely play the game like the same way that humans would be able to with no limitations by august hmm. and so you you know you said that, that this makes you think about how smart humans are. are were there any limitations put on the humans like anything a human couldn't do in order to level level the playing field uh that i'm not entirely sure of um but so that the, the Humans that the bots beat now were just kind of the best humans at, at OpenAI's um, lab. Uh, it was kind of moderated and, and announced by a professional uh, Dota 2 player, but I wouldn't take the, this kind of like pre preliminary result and like announcement of what's happening at the international to kind of um, be a benchmark because we don't really know how good these players were. Um, you know, you can watch some of the, the, the gameplay and, and try to figure that out. But I think what we're really going to see is um, we're going to have to wait till August. Something that's that's kind of occurring to me right now as, as we're talking about this and as AI is becoming more and more proliferated, it's, it's, you know, becoming more of a household name, maybe not a household name, maybe in technology circles it is. But anyways, uh, is this idea that AI, you know, as like a gameplay opponent it's right right now it seems to be such you know, such a unique thing that an entire event is built around it let's see how humans compare to this ai but often when people are playing games they're playing against a computer if they aren't playing against real people and maybe that computer you know instance of of gameplay isn't quite as smart as say an ai opponent do do you see any indication of somewhere down the line there being an opportunity for everyday people to be able to go up against these legendary AI computers to see how they fare against them in that case? Really, I think that uh, a lot of the big gaming companies are investing a lot into into this kind of research, and, and um, I, if I remember correctly, Activision Blizzard has been working with, I believe, DeepMind or, or, or one AI research outfit um, to kind of give them access to their API to for StarCraft, which is another game that, that mm -hmm. takes a lot of coordination between people. So I think um, that there's a lot more coming. And, and But for these kind of like monolithic first, you know, almost deep blue style um, AIs, like, you know, it would be uh, AlphaGo for, for Go or... or um, the, the OpenAI 5 for, for Dota 2, I think it really, it's just really up to whether uh, OpenAI decides to open source them. And that's kind of like the magic of, of this software is that like it's pretty easy to open source a lot of this stuff um, like the, once they're already trained and, and just throw them on GitHub or something like that. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm a fan of hyperbole, especially when it comes to the robot apocalypse. So can I presume if they win that robots are going to be able to form teams and work to take over the world. <laughs> that's okay. So that's actually not that crazy. So the first okay. thing that I asked with uh, when I was talking to to Greg at, at Brockman at OpenAI was um, I had seen that he had done a, a lot of similar research with with robotics um, in terms of this this learning and simulation. And I asked him what overlap there was, and he said that they were actually working um, on on a few projects where um, there are there's there's applying some of the things that they learned here to robotics, they're applying some of the things they've learned in, in robotics to this. Um, and if you think about this in terms of the robotics that we already have, like Boston Dynamics um, or, you know, industrial robots, uh, Peter Abiel, who came from OpenAI, um, actually did a, spun out a, a new uh, startup out of, to kind of work on these same reinforcement learning type 
uh, approaches. Um, it's not crazy to think that a lot of the things that we're learning here in a virtual world will kind of be um, translated into into the physical. But I think the more realistic thing, at least at first, when you're talking about consumer, I mean, commercial applications of this are like build like robots that will build a car or something like that. Um, I'm going to step away from the scary angle uh, because I'm now very frightened sure. by what Megan just said. <laughs> uh, reinforcement learning. So obviously a large part of this was, was based around that approach for, you know, teaching the AI how to play a game. I'm just kind of curious, like reinforcement learning is one angle that can be taken, one strategy that can be taken to make these these systems smarter. What are what are some of the others, or, or what is reinforcement uh, learning particularly good at? Like gaming, obviously, but what other applications? So, like I said, Peter Rubiel, who was at OpenAI, is trying to take this and turn it into um, robotics. So, reinforcement learning is like when there's a task that needs to be done over and over and over again. Um, that's very similar, but there's you know variation due to just the world. Um, so reinforcement learning is actually really, really good for robotics. At least that's what you know a bunch of these startups are claiming. Um, when you talk about uh, other core AI, uh, I guess just flavors that you see like uh, deep learning for image recognition, which are like convolutional neural networks, um, or they, I mean even these were like a, a, a it's reinforcement learning, but like with something, some other kind, like an LSTM um, built in. Uh, it's it gets very complicated very quickly. But a lot of like image recognition is actually can be used to service reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is kind of like a, a bigger overarching thing that can be used to make decisions in an environment. And image recognition, speech recognition, kind of can be used to, to service that decision making in a way. So you said in the beginning that part of why they're so successful is that they're very selfish in the beginning. And then at a certain point, they turn up the metrics. So could we learn that if you're a human being part of a team or saying like a podcasting team or something, like if you should like be selfish and cut the other person down until you're a certain amount of successful and then you would succeed more? Can we learn that? Well, I think it's like the basic concept of practice, right? So it's, 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 you know, I used to play in a band and, you know, we would all, a band that only practices together isn't very good, especially at the beginning. Um, so you got to go out, you got to learn your scales, you got to practice how to do your thing. And then you bring it back and you bring it back to the team, you bring it back to the band. So I guess that's kind of the way that I see it. Okay, good. <laughs> So, Jason, don't worry. Okay. I'm not, not entirely sure <laughs> okay. what I just learned okay. right there. Okay. But. So now, uh, Dave, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Dave Gershkorn is not an artificially intelligent reporter, but an artificial intelligence reporter at Quartz. Thanks so much for coming on.